Uh, first of all, thank you very much for um, coming. And I'm so happy that um, your teacher asked uh, me to come here because um, this has been a big deal to us and I'm happy to share it, especially with people who might go out there and do the same thing and maybe cure somebody else one day. So um, you guys, some of you may know Caitlin. I think probably a lot of you have heard Caitlin in the hallways because she's kind of loud sometimes. Um, but I want to give you an overview of Rett syndrome. And Rett syndrome is a, is a rare disorder. It happens to less than 200,000 people in the United States. Basically, one in 10 to 15,000 live female births, one of those children are going to get Rett syndrome. And when they're born, generally speaking, they're perfect. You don't know anything is wrong with them. There isn't anything wrong with them. They are a perfectly normal baby. They learn everything they're supposed to learn right on time. They reach all their milestones. She crawled, she walked, she talked, she fed herself. And at 15 months of age, she started to lose it. It started to all go away. Um, and by the time she was 18 months of age, so at 15 months of age, she was a perfectly normal 15 month old baby. She said the right number of words, she walked, she fed herself. Um, by the time she was 18 months of age, she was back to being basically a newborn. She no longer spoke, she no longer taught, uh, used her hands, she no longer could feed herself, and she could no longer walk. Uh, luckily, um, Caitlin is one of the very few lucky children who lost everything and has been able to regain some of it. So um, she can walk now. Um, she can feed herself now. It took me seven years to reteach her how to feed herself from the age of two to nine. Um, at the age of, I think, three, she said her first word again, which was mommy, which was really nice to hear the second time around and um, she slowly gained some words over time but again she is in the one percentile for Rett syndrome in regards to her language and her ability so 99 percent of the other children are not as, as high functioning as Caitlin and I can't think of anyone who actually would say she's high functioning so that just gives you an idea of how devastating this disease can be she did have seizures for several years um, she became paralyzed on her uh, right side after um, going into status epilepticus and um, her right side's never quite been the same since then. Um, but some girls have 20 seizures a day, every day. Caitlin has uh, kyphosis, which is like a hunchback, um, and she's lucky because most girls get scoliosis. And if they don't catch it in time, those children can't have surgery and their parents wait for them to die as their bone and their spine twist so badly that it crushes their internal organs and they can no longer breathe and it breaks, it just um, explodes their heart. They bleed internally and die. Um, some children are perfectly fine and their parents put them to bed at night and when they go to check on them in the morning, they're gone. No reason. I have to prepare myself for that every day. Even though I look at Caitlin and she's healthy, there's still the chance that every day she could die and I won't know the reason why. And that's why we're all so desperate for a cure. So that's an overview of Rett syndrome. Um, now I'm going to talk, so we're going to watch Caitlin's journey and then I'll talk about NNZ. So here's a little bit about Caitlin. So you can kind of see her journey through the years. And I apologize for the donation picture at the end. It was part of the video. I couldn't take it out. I tried. <laughs> when I look into your eyes, it's like watching the night sky. Thank you. 
to be right where you are. How old is your soul? I won't give up on us, even if the skies get rough. I'm giving you. everything that a normal person her age likes. She really likes boys. Um, <laughs> and so one of the important things about Red Syndrome is that she understands everything. So everything that people say to her, her brain understands it. Her receptive language, which is the coming in language, is fine. It's the, her inability to have expressive language. That is the problem. And so I'm going to um, have you guys do kind of a little visual here. So NNZ2566 is a medication that she store? took. Yeah, are you going to go to the store? Are you going to buy mommy? Can you buy me some bread? No, no, no. I see you smiling. Um, so NNZ2566 is a modified version of a naturally occurring compound in the body. And IGF-1 is an important compound in your body. It helps you grow. And there is a portion of the IGF-1 protein that is responsible for brain repair. So someone discovered what portion of the IGF-1 protein does that. They chopped it off, modified it, and made it so that it could be drank and cross the blood-brain barrier, which is very important. So it grows, what it does is grow connections in the red brain. I'm going to put this down for a second. In Caitlin's brain, can everybody hear me? In Caitlin's brain, another red children's brain, I want you guys to take your hands and hold them, make fists. 
fists like this and hold them far apart. This is one nerve cell in Caitlin's brain. This is the other one. In a typically occurring um, brain, there would be little oh, fingers dog. that come off the off the nerve cells and shorten the synaptic space so that the so brain's message can go from the brain to nerve cell to nerve cell. So in Caitlin's brain, she doesn't have those fingers. What NNZ256 does is now, if you guys will just open up your hands, you're going to see that now the synaptic space is much smaller. So here is Caitlin's brain, and the brain is sending out signals, and there's all this space in here and the message just gets lost. It's trying hard to work, it just can't do it. So when an NG goes in there and grows the fingers on the nerve cells, now she has lots of synaptic um, connections that are shorter, and the brain can send the message to where it needs to go. This is, in my mind, a miracle, <laughs> okay? Uh, there is a similar study going on with Fragile X. So fragile X is another genetic disorder. In that disorder, there's too many connections. It's like there's three hands with fingers all over the place. And this same medication will go in there and take away the extra connections so that, so that children with Fragile X can communicate because they can't communicate. They're very oversensitive and um, this helps, it helps their brain as well. Now, there's a trial going on in Boston, it has been going on for some time, called the IGF-1 trial. And um, because it's already a FDA-approved drug, there's hope that it will help red children, and it's an easy step from trial to getting approved because it's already approved for other things. But one of the problems with IGF-1 is that you can't give it to older children because it affects bone growth. So if they were to give IGF-1 to Caitlin, her face would grow, her facial bones would grow, and cause all kinds of deformity and problems. One of the advantages to NNZ is that it has the potential to be given to anyone. So it, down the road when they are able to start pediatric trials, it's possible, and the hope is, that it's found safe in the pediatric population, and NNZ can be given to anyone. So that's a real big plus. Plus, NNZ is an oral medication and IGF-1 is an injection. <laughs> Next slide, Mr. Larkin. We did that one. We, um, so what are some of the emotional sides of experimenting? Like your teacher said, uh, it can be very emotional. Uh, first of all, you're just so filled with hope. Oh my God, there's something there that might help my child. I want to do it. Um, it's uh, after Caitlin was 18, um, 19 years old when we, we started this process. And so for 17 years, I couldn't do anything. I just watched this disorder attack my child on a daily basis and worried all the time what was the next thing that was going to happen at the bioware. And uh, it was so nice to kind of punch Rhett syndrome in the face, you know? You're just like, I want to do something, and I, I, want, to, I want to do something, anything, anything at all. And um, I think that most likely that's how all parents felt. Whether they were going to get the placebo or not, we understood that that was something that was possible. We were all hopeful that our child, of course, would get the medication, but we were all prepared for them not to. Um, but we're just so desperate for some kind of effective treatment that we really didn't care. It just had to happen. Um, so what if Caitlin wasn't improving? I, I can't say how I would feel about that because Caitlin improved on this medication. Um, and I'm not allowed to speak for the parents whose children did not. Now, side effects of the medication, I can't go into. Um, Caitlin had some slight GI upset. Um, what other side effects there might be, um, I'm not at liberty to say. However, um, they, if there were any, they weren't significant. And that is in your handout that shows that there was no significant side effects that would um, prevent this medication from being given at this point. And so, uh, let's see. 
Was I worried about the side effects? Now that's a good question. Was I worried about side effects? And the answer is no, I was not worried about side effects. And the reason was because I did research and found that um, NNZ2566 under the um, trial name of Intrepid2566 is a long ongoing study with the US Army for traumatic brain injury. So you can see by some of the things that I'm mentioning, this medication has a lot of potential and um, is being looked at in a myriad of very serious neurologic um, problems. And also, uh, because that trial is still ongoing, I figured, you know, it can't be that bad if it's been 10 years and you're still giving this to people, I'm, I'm gonna go with it safe. And because it's only a modified portion of something that's already in our bodies, I wasn't really worried at all. And Mama's going home now? Mommy is not going home now, Kate, and I'm still talking. <laughs> okay, so what's a double blind study? Double blind study is means that I don't know if Caitlin got the medication and her doctors don't know if Caitlin got the medication. No, no one knows except the um, people who now have the records know which child got the placebo and which child got the medication. However, <clears throat> going into the trial, we knew that two thirds of the children would get the medication and one third would not. And the way they did this trial was in three sections. It's called an escalation trial. And I, my understanding is that this is a good way to do a trial when there's not a large population to, to uh, pull from. So Rett syndrome is very rare and they limited it to um, adults 16 to 45. That's not a lot of people, people. <laughs> so you have to do something to um, show a progression with a small amount of people. So. A few people in the beginning got half dose for 14 days. Caitlin was in the group that either got the placebo or the half dose for 28 days. And after two people, I think, after Caitlin, they went to the full dose for 28 days. Okay, so then we're gonna go to the administration. So how was it administered? I, was, I already told you it was an oral medication. It was strawberry flavored. So that was one of the exclusion criteria. If you were allergic to um, strawberries, you couldn't be in the trial. Um, and Caitlin spent a week in the hospital. And what that entailed was um, a lot of testing. She was, um, blood was drawn. She was hooked up to an EEG machine, which took about 30 minutes to do. Um, she had her um, respirations monitored. She had a um, wire put into her nose so that they could monitor how much oxygen she had. She had things on her legs. She had um, and it, a whole bunch of wires on her head for an EEG. And she was hooked up to that. And as soon as they were ready, the medication was given, the button was pushed, and she was monitored for an hour and a half um, on the EEG machine. And after that was all over, she had an EKG. And I know, you remember that, don't you? <laughs> and her least favorite thing was the thing in her nose, but if a gentleman named Rory came in the room, she handled it much better. <laughs> so Rory was often on call when Caitlin, when Caitlin was there to be monitored. As a matter of fact, he, they would literally page him to come and be in Caitlin's room. So, <laughs> um, one of the things, and then we were given enough medication to go through, yes? How long did Katie start the trial? Katie started the trial, we went in October of 2014 for baseline testing to see if she qualified. She almost didn't qualify because she has some language. Um, so there was some real talking back and forth, but they decided that since she doesn't have effective language, that means she can't have a conversation or anything like that, that she could be in it. And then we went back down in November. The trial started in November and went through the end of December. So you noticed the improvement in the past year? We'll get into that. So, um, and then we were sent home, which was the Ronald McDonald House, with enough medication to the next follow-up where it all just happened all over again. Okay. The next thing. Okay, the forms. Oh, God, forms. Whoever here goes into clinical trials, 
please do something about the forms. <laughs> there are so many forms, and there, I mean, all of them are necessary, I'm sure, but on the parent end, we're like, at the, I'm just like, okay, whatever, sign, sign, sign. Um, first of all, the trial was very well detailed and explained out. There, there was no miscommunication, there was no misunderstanding. You could go day by day and know what was going to happen. So they would tell me, on this day, this many blood draws. On this day, this many blood draws. So every day I knew exactly how many blood draws was going to happen, uh, how many EKGs were going to happen, um, how much medication she was going to get. It, it was all spelled out very, very clearly. It was wonderfully well done, and um, I was actually pretty impressed. And the other thing that we filled out were forms about things like our main I'm concerns. No, you're not going to the house. Be quiet. On the bus. You can go on the bus later. Uh, so they, we had to fill out forms about our impression of how severe our daughter's problems were. And every caregiver had different top three concerns. My top three concerns for Caitlin were her behavior and anxiety level, her verbal language, and um, her hand use. Those were my three concerns, but every parent's concerns would have been different. So uh, we, fi we filled those out every visit so that they could monitor whether or not they improved, stayed the same, or got worse. And then, because Caitlin can walk, she was periodically videotaped. I do not know the results of her videotaping. I don't know if they noticed anything different, and I also do not know about the EEGs, whether or not the medication normalized her EEGs, and I don't think I'm ever going to be given that information, which I'm okay with. Okay. Don't so stay home, boy. Here, what, did we meet with other families? Um, yes, we did meet other families. We didn't interact a lot. Um, they did a staggered thing so that we weren't actually there was no more than one child in the hospital at a time. Um, but because it's so rare, you hardly ever meet another family. And they did, the doctors did give us an opportunity to meet. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about what we were all going through. Um, but mostly it was just nice to talk to other parents about other things. Like, what do you do about your daughter's this? or what did you do? What did you figure about that? Because we're always looking for information about how better to help our own children. And the, only, the best people for that is other parents. So a lot of our discussion was about totally different things that we, that we wanted help on. <laughs> okay. So as I said, um, we don't know who got the placebo yet. We'll find out in April or May. Um, even her doctors don't know yet. And um, it's very important not to know who got the placebo or the medication until the trial is complete. And so we'll find out. And um, however, we're, anyone who knows Caitlin is pretty sure she got the medication. That's our impression. Um, now, what is the next step now? So now we've had the trial and we're all finished. What does the drug company do next? And what this drug company did was apply for orphan drug status and breakthrough therapy status. Can I see a snapshot, Ms. Watson? So here's, the FDA has many programs about drug development. Um, some take a lot longer, um, some are shorter. It, it just depends on one, is there already an effective treatment out there? Um, so if there's already a treatment out there, in order to get, um, what did you do? <laughs> did you do this in class too, like accidentally erase something on the blackboard? <laughs> You tell him, Mr. Watson. Down, down, down. Down, up, up. 
down. <laughs> there. <laughs> You do have, you have it in your handout. Oh. Don't touch anything. Go away from the machine. <laughs> ah. drug company is hoping um, to get is orphan drug designation and an orphan drug is for a um, disease or disorder that affects less than 200,000 people in the United States. And this is a really good thing for the company that's in development because it gives them seven years market exclusivity in the US, gives them tax credits and um, the FDA works with them closely. Um, when they're developing the drug and helps guide them um, so they don't have to guess. So I, I gather that a lot of people who are developing drugs, they just kind of guess what the FDA is looking for and then the FDA, FDA can say, oops, you know, that wasn't it. <laughs> so what is helpful for this is that the FDA will kind of guide you and tell you what the next step is for you to do and it really speeds up the process. The one that I'm hoping for and a lot of other rep families are hoping for is breakthrough therapy designation and this is um, a very low rate of success, Third, about 30 percent of drugs that apply for this are given breakthrough dr therapy designation um, but we, we're hopeful. You have to have a relatively high efficacy bar, and you can look in your handout later. You'll see that um, in the in Neuron's release, they do show that that the drug was effective, even though that this was a safety trial. They they preset hopeful things to meet, and they met them in in three core groups. And just equally as important, they show no worsening in the other groups. So. It's just as important to show improvement as it is to show no worsening. Um, you, it provides the benefit of fast track designation, which is an intensive interaction and guidance from the FDA. So this is what we want because it will speed up the process by years from getting it to where we are now to when um, the children and women and boys hopefully one day can get it. So I do feel that Caitlin received the medication and we're gonna show you some of the experiments that I did. I'm kind of a scientist at heart. And um, so when we went down to Texas for Caitlin's um, baseline testing to see if she was gonna be allowed to be in the trial. Okay. I, okay, you did good, didn't you? Can you clap your hands, yay? You did so good, you were so brave. Um, I took her to Children's Museum, the best children's museum in the country. It rocked. Um, so I'm going to show you what I call the vortex experiment. Get close so you can pause it, Mr. Watson. Don't let that other teacher near it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Had to go home? You had to go home. Not yet. Two o'clock. Okay, so in this video right here, you're going to be seeing Caitlin throwing a ball into the vortex pre-trial. This is something that we did in October when we went down for her baseline testing. And you're going to see how she's able to drop the ball into the vortex. Go ahead, Mr. Watson. So you can see her, she let it go. And um, first I want to point out that that puts her in the one percentile of Rett syndrome children. That ability right there. Okay, so in this one, she's been in the trial, she's been on medication, I think, for about 14 days. Go ahead, Mr. Watson.
Now, anybody who doesn't see the difference, raise their hand. <laughs> She's chucking it in. She, literally, I spent a lot of time crying in Texas. So, she's, you can easily see the difference. So this is one experiment that I did that I feel shows that Caitlin was on the medication, a definite improvement in her motor function. Now, this, what you're gonna see, is several days after she got her last dose of medication. Mr. Watson, can you just kind of speed it up towards the end? So it's taking quite a bit of coaxing. You move that little dot a little bit faster. There you go. So after, and this is edited, so it actually took me about four minutes to coax her to do this. go so back to baseline so in my mind this experiment shows what her baseline was that she improved while she was on the medication and she returned to baseline after the medication and this was something that we were expecting if she got put on the medication like I believe but do not know the other thing um, is something that I, I did is a coloring experiment so if you're gonna see at the top the top picture there is day one. And basically she just dabbed the marker on the piece of paper in little dots. On day two, you can see that she's starting to do a couple of lines there, and the paper is more covered. On day four, there isn't any dots. She made very purposeful marks on that paper, very wide and long mar um, strokes with her hand. Now, the next shot, is day 16 on being on medication, and this is a circle. I asked her to draw a circle, and she drew a circle right there. And the thing to notice is that she started on that little tail there that's to the right, went around, and didn't cross that line. This is a miracle to me. And the researchers were very excited about this circle, and I was able to tape it, and they were able to see how she used her marker to make it. And now we're gonna go to the next one. And now this is day 39. And as you can see, it looks very similar to day two. So she is starting to lose her skill again and reverting backwards towards baseline. Is there any question? I'll give opportunities. Is there any questions about this, these experiments that I did? No, yes. How do I No. The trial ended. The last day um, was day 40, and um, she'd been off the medication for almost two weeks at that point. And this is the last um, experiment that I did. I took her painting, and this is day two off. This is the day two off of meds completely. But you can see that Caitlin used different colors. She filled up this complete tile in one sitting, which was about an approximate hour. And Mr. Watson said I should point out that I drew the flower. But Caitlin, <laughs> Caitlin did the background. Now I took her again. And we'll go to the next slide. And I took her again. This is nine days after she was off the medication. And you can see that she only chose one color and she pretty much stayed in one spot. She, um, it took three visits to fill this tile and I had to actually rotate it for her so that she would reach the spots that weren't covered. Okay. okay. So in a trial, it, there's always blocking. Yes? Uh, there was a initial trial of a very small number of girls, and I don't know what that number is, um, a very small safety study. 
to make sure, uh, to, then to go to the larger one. So Caitlin was in phase two trial. So there was a phase one trial, very small number of girls, very short amount of time, just to make sure there wasn't any major serious side effects. She was not in that one. Different girls are in different trials. Like if there's another trial after this one, she won't be in that one. They need a different. She wasn't in trial one. She was only in. in okay, in her, she was in what's called the phase two trial. She remembers that. And I will tell you why I know she remembers that. Because when I told her that the results of the medication came out and it showed very successful and that she would most likely be getting the medication soon, um, and soon is a relative word, but um, she clapped her hands. So she was very excited about that. And um, another mom told her daughter, and her daughter uses a computer to speak. Yes, I see the door. Her daughter uses a computer to speak, an eye gaze device, and she looks at it and it talks for her. And she asked her mother if she would talk. And her mother says, I don't know, I think you, you probably will talk if you get this medication. And she says, if I talk, I want a phone. <laughs> so I told Caitlin that what that mom and daughter had said and she's thinking about it. And I said, you know what, Caitlin, if you can talk, like I think you will be able to, I'll get you a phone. So I was telling the librarians about it a couple weeks later, and um, she starts going like this. And I'm like, what? And she goes, my phone. <laughs> I, said, I said, yes, you can have a phone. Dead right away, car. <laughs> like, no, no car. Not yet. So yes, she does remember. And, um, and she is very proud of herself. And she was very brave. My kid hates the doctor. Okay, so if she had not understood the importance of what she was doing, she would have been a holy terror. But she wasn't. She was very brave. She tried her best to stay calm when they were sticking this metal thing in her nose. And she would never have done that if she didn't understand the importance of what she was going through. Oh, yes. Is she on the medication filled there? No. So she, um, the medication lasted for 28 days. And um, after that, she did lose everything that she had gained during the trial. And there is no residual effect at this point. And um, the FDA will decide what the next step is. So you have to go through step by step um, in order to get to her getting the medication again. The drug has to be approved. If the drug doesn't get approved, she doesn't get it. Um, it's all up to the FDA. Um, the, any number of scenarios that can happen um, based on whether or not they approve these two applications. I cannot speak for the FDA. Yes, sir? If they find out that it's uh, effective, that, that there is, that was um, positive, uh, the positive results, will the subjects who are getting placebo get the drugs? Will they get these drugs before the general population? Or does everyone have to wait for it to go through all of that? Okay. The, um, what I was told is there a thing, is a thing called compassionate care. So, um, no one will get it if the FDA doesn't approve it. So, um, as far as Caitlin and the other participants getting it sooner than the general population, my understanding is that whatever steps it takes for the FDA to approve it, at some point there, Caitlin and the other participants will get it, even I think like if insurance doesn't cover it yet, or that kind of thing, and they will, provided for a certain amount of time. Uh, but when that is, and um, how long they provide it for, I do not know, and it's all up to the FDA. So is it possible that someone who uh, was a subject that was in the trial, that found that did see improvements later on, the FDA approves the drug, and their insurance company doesn't cover the drug, is it possible that they couldn't afford this? I have no idea about the answer to that question. 
I don't know. I have no idea how much it would cost out of pocket. Well, because it's an experimental drug, we have absolutely no idea. And there's not been any pediatric trials yet. And so um, until a drug is proven safe and effective in an adult population, if there is an adult population available, which there is, they will not give it to children. Yes? Um, we have, Red Syndrome has a large following on Facebook. So we, um, we know each other through there. And um, at this point, we're all just waiting. Any other questions before we go on? OK. So what are uh, some of the um, exclusion um, criteria other than um, what I went over? Well, uh, you couldn't, here's the exclusion criteria and the inclusion criteria. First of all, you have to have you have to have the gene, the mutation, or you couldn't be in the trial. Um, that was very important. There are some girls who are clinically diagnosed with Rett syndrome, and there are a handful of boys in the world that have Rett syndrome. The only way for a boy to have Rett syndrome is that he has two X's and one Y. So he has to have XXY to have Rett syndrome. Otherwise, the boys do not survive. All right, and then you couldn't have, one of the other things we kind of watch for on Caitlin it, and all girls is um, cardiac issues. So um, you couldn't have what's called prolonged QT, which is a common cardiac issue with children with Rett syndrome, where the, when the heart is beating, it just rests too long. So prolonged QT is where your heart will just rest too long and she has to be monitored for it because in some girls that rust just keeps going on and it never it never stops and then their heart stops beating and the bad thing is you, you couldn't you know the the strawberry thing i'm a little thrown off by that i hope that uh, they can come up with a different flavor so that uh, so maybe if there's a red girl out there allergic to strawberries that she can have the medication later on <laughs> um, so what are the next steps for kate and the other participants we kind of went over um and as mentioned we're just waiting for the fda and they're going to direct the next steps They'll tell the drug company what they need to do, um, whether or not they approve one or both of these um, applications that they put in for. But um, as you can see in the handout, and because you are the math people and I am not, you might be able to understand the graphs better than me, but I'm told that they show improvement. <laughs> so um, at the, um, on the last couple of pages. So there was an improvement in the caregiver's concerns and um, other areas, motor function, and I think one other. And the important thing about um, this trial, and I don't know how many other trials run, but um, the great thing is that the doctors filled out the same sort of forms, and so the doctors and the caregivers forms gelled. So it wasn't wishful thinking on the parent's part, which is something that you want to take into effect. Oh, the parent hopes so much that there's uh, an improvement that even though it's a placebo, they see a response that's not really there. So everything that the parents noted, the doctors noted. So there didn't seem to be any of that placebo effect. Now, for one thing, Caitlin couldn't have done a placebo effect. There's no way that Caitlin herself could have said, oh, I know I'm, I'm getting this medication and I'm going to fake it and, and have a placebo effect. That's beyond her capability. So anything that I noticed, and that's why I took the video, is because I wanted to be able to sub objectively look, not subjectively think, but objectively look at the evidence that I saw and know for myself what I believed.
pit. So, and I think. Mama, soon all your come. I think that's. Is that it, Mr. Watson? That's it. That's it. So now I'm open to um, questions and answers. Okay. So are you waiting to get the muffin on the floor? Yeah. Um, both. I'm not as I'm not as anxious about finding out whether or not she was on the placebo or not. Um, I'm curious, but I'm not as frantically waiting as I am for the FDA to say yes or no. Then I'm pretty sure she was on the medication, so it'll be nice to know if I was right. Um, but in the end, I don't care. I just want the FDA to come back with a yes. Okay. Yes. That's my hope, um, but that is probably wishful thinking. Um, first of all, we don't know. Um, I do know that the girls who received the full dose versus the half dose improved even more. And I felt really great about the improvements that Caitlin had. So I can't wait to see what improvements she would have on a full dose. Um, but what to what point she would get, no one knows because it's an it's a experimental drug so um, we, we don't know and it we won't know until the girls when if they're able to get it and it's approved get on it for long term okay well first um, they did take a shorter amount of time to show improvement than to lose it. So there was some residual effect of the medication, um, but it wasn't a long time. Um, and I saw some improvements the very next day. Um, did I really see them? I think I saw them. Um, so I think I taped a lot of her feeding and um, I do believe that by the second day, she had better hand use when she was eating. Typically when Caitlin eats, both hands come up to her mouth kind of like this. She has the fork in her hand and her other, her right hand will be here and she'll be feeding herself. So get the, and then her right hand will come up. But the second day of her getting the medication, her right hand was falling away and she was only using her left hand. Um, one of the things that um, I didn't notice is that Caitlin has a repetitive hand movement, which is the classic sign for Rett syndrome. Um, almost every single girl that has Rett syndrome and boy will have some kind of repetitive hand movement. And Caitlin's looks like this. She pretty much does this all day long. And she can stop, which again puts her in the one percentile for Rett syndrome because she's able to stop her hand and use her hands. Um, I did not see a real change in that. I, I was hopeful to see a change in that, but I cannot say that I saw a change in that. She still did it. So um, was I disappointed in that? Yes, I was. I, I was hopeful to see that stop, but um, I saw so many other improvements that I had to let that go. But uh, back to the emotional side, that was kind of a disappointment for me, uh, to, to be honest. Yes, sir? Yes, she is one of the highest functioning Rett syndrome that you will see. And, the, uh, there are some that are more high functioning than her, but 99% are lower. And, uh, and you said this drug is being used by the U.S. Army for traumatic brain injury, brain injuries? Yes. It's not like a post-traumatic stress thing. Oh, that are physical injuries to the brain? That's yes. And how long, do you, do you know, uh, do you guys get any literature on you, you can Google it. It's a very interesting study, and it's called Intrepid 2566. Really? Do you, could you mind? You're interrupting over here. Yes, you're in school. Um, it's a very interesting study. Um, I don't remember at which point they're at now, but um, they're doing different degrees of traumatic brain injury. Um, and my understanding is, from what I've read, that they're hoping to branch out into concussion. So they're, 
they're going and the army has just refunded that study so it's going to be going on for quite some time oh the soda story oh my goodness okay so um <laughs> caitlin Caitlin has pretty good hand use, but she doesn't have a lot of coordination sometimes. And so she sometimes tries to pour things and they just go all over the place. But when she was in the trial, she looked and saw a bottle of soda on the, on the table and a cup. And I think she just said to herself, I think I'm gonna go try that. And I, all of a sudden I looked over and she'd taken the top off the soda and poured it into a cup. She didn't overflow the cup. She just poured it into the cup like a normal person. And I, I, I think we both looked at each other, we were both astonished that that was possible. And then we got a little crazy and I kept pouring the soda back into the soda bottle and she kept pouring the soda back into the cup and we must have done that for about 15 minutes and she's laughing hysterical. I'm crying because I had never in my life thought I would ever see anything like that. And it was so much fun to watch her do that and she she was just so proud of herself it was a real highlight of my life actually through social media uh, it got posted on Facebook so every, up until last time all the trials had been on the younger children so uh, us older parents couldn't do anything and so um, it got posted on Facebook um, by one of the people higher higher up in the International Red Syndrome Foundation that there was a trial window curve for girls 16 to 45 and um, when the word was put out they would um, post it and we would know to go put her name on the waiting list so as soon as they posted it, I emailed the person and had Caitlin put on the waiting list. Then I waited about a year and a half, waiting for them to um, set the criteria, the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria, get all the things in place. And then um, in April, in April before she went down, I got an email saying, if you still want your child to participate, okay. Uh, if I do, um, she was welcome to come down and get tested, and um, I I was able to choose which number she was. They they had like a list of openings, and you signed up for which time bracket you wanted. And then uh, she that was in April. She went in November, uh, October, and then the child was done in November in December. Yes. Um, I don't know how it is with some trials. I, I, you know, you hear on the like the radio, oh, come down, we'll pay you, whatever. I don't know what kind of trial that is, but it's not of the standard this trial was. So there was to be no, um, the parents were responsible for the entire cost, except for the time in the hospital. So our airfare, our hotel fare, our food, recreation, everything was my responsibility. You first. Yep. Um, how many people participated in the trial? Did they turn people away? Uh, no, that wasn't an issue. The issue was filling it up. And the, the reason why it was difficult to fill up was because first there's, it is so expensive. Uh, and luckily I don't work, so I was able to stay in Texas. And we stayed in Texas for 40 days or about. Um, and uh, so we didn't fly back and forth. But a lot of families would have to fly back and forth for their follow-up appointments. So it's extremely expensive to participate in trials. And then um, secondly, um, people were nervous about it. Uh, that was obvious. There were some people who were unsure. They didn't, they weren't, they were nervous about what might happen about it. I can say that much because it was clear that they were having a hard time filling the trial. Um, and it was actually, I think, delayed by about three months as they waited to fill it. They opened up, they, then they ended up uh, trying to cut down on the cost for some people. They opened up different trial hospitals. So it started out as one in Texas and they ended up opening two more, hoping to get more participants. 
No, there was somebody over here. You okay. Okay. Okay, so you, you can see her. Um, she, she's able to use her hands. She walked here. You've heard her speak. Um, she's not seizing. She's not, um, she not have an abnormal breathing pattern. A lot of girls have an abnormal breathing pattern where they hyperventilate and then stop breathing. And then um, some girls shake really badly. They um, have this, Caitlin has, apraxia to a certain degree, which is the inability to do what your brain wants you to do. But some girls um, shake terribly, um, and it never stops unless they're sleeping. So she is far and above most children with Rett syndrome. Uh, more than 50% cannot walk. Um, I'd say um, very few Percentage, I don't know the exact percent, cannot speak a single word. Their parents will never hear them talk. However, with the advent of eye gaze devices, which is a new technology, um, it's a computer that reads your eyes by infrared, um, the children, they've learned that the children do have receptive language and started early enough, can learn at age appropriate level and use their topi or other eye gaze device to take tests and read and learn to read and learn to write um, without using their hands. You. Yep. Her speaking? Yes. Yes, it did. And this is a. Yes. She actually three sentences, but. So she did. She did. And. Um, it's a matter of contention between the two of us because the first sentence that she spoke in her entire life was not, Mommy, I love you, thank you so much. No, it was, you're a cute guy. <laughs> I was like, all right, all right, I see where this is going. Her second, second sentence in her whole life, she's flirting with a gentleman and there's a woman standing next to him and she goes, is that your wife? Like, you know, I'm kind of getting chipped here. Um, her third sentence wasn't as exciting or anything like that, but uh, uh, she was looking for a book, and I said, do you want this book? And she said, no, I want these books over here. And so, so what you're hearing right now is her baseline. So imagine that she spoke three full grammatically correct sentences for the first time in her life. And this was when she was on the medication, or placebo, whichever one it was. Yes? Um, uh, so you said that she's in the top 1%. So, the most in the most worst case scenario? I know well, very badly yeah. what our worst case scenario is. Worst case scenarios for children with Rett syndrome is that um, they never once use their hands. Some are born with Rett syndrome. Um, most aren't, but some are. They never use their hands, they never speak, they have a feeding tube, they um, have terrible um, problems with pneumonia if they have scoliosis, their lung function is um, decreased and affected so they end up having pneumonia. Um, that causes a lot of deaths in red children. Um, another problem is, and it, it kind of sounds funny, but it's not, and it's called um, chronic constipation. So in children with Rett syndrome, their peristalsis is slow. Their, their intestines and everything doesn't move as quickly as a normal human being. So what happens is um, children with Rett syndrome can have severe GI issues. They have perforated bowel, they can be impacted, they can have blockages, they, um, their bowels can twist, um, they can have, and the bad thing about all of that, because not even Caitlin can tell me where it hurts. So you can have a child who normally screams, and they're screaming, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, well, there they go screaming again, we're in actuality. Maybe their appendix is twist, uh, perf you know, or their appendix um, exploded, or their intestines twisted, or um, they now are faced with uh, in, 
uh, per, um, what's it called, a uh, perforation of the bowel, and you have no idea. Uh, some girls, like I said, get scoliosis so bad it just crushes their internal organs. They twist like a corkscrew, and then they die. Um, yes, it can, and uh, but it's rare. Normally, it happens between six and eighteen months of age. But there are some instances of late onset Rett syndrome. Um, I knew a child in uh, Washington who was four when it happened. Um, she was she was reading and writing, and then within the space of days, she was like Caitlin, and and had developed seizures. And there is a. I think there is, the oldest person I heard of is either 9 or 16. Yes? You mentioned um, that, that one of the inclusion things was having a gene mutation. Mm -hmm. Is it something that can be screened before one that infants um, We're not there. It's so rare. It doesn't, even, it doesn't even typically run in families. There are a few families that it runs in, and that's how they discovered the gene, because there was one particular family that had several children that had Rett syndrome, and one of the women who had Rett syndrome was fairly high functioning, and she actually got married and had children with Rett syndrome. So they were used that family um, and went from there, and that's how they discovered the gene. And is it always a gene mutation? Oh, uh, outside. Oh, really? You can go outside? Okay. You can go outside. Um, there, if. <laughs> Yes and no. They if they haven't some girls they haven't found the mutation on them yet. Yeah. So some girls are clinically diagnosed with Rett syndrome. That doesn't mean they don't have a mutation. That it could mean that they just haven't figured out. They haven't found that one yet. I I don't know the whole answer. It's poss I could be possible, but my understanding is that it's a genetic mutation, and um, sometimes they just haven't found it yet. Oh, yeah. you. I, I have like three short questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, I don't know if you know how shorthand, like, when Rett's was like, discovered. Um, Rett syndrome was discovered by Dr. Andreas Rett um, back in 19, I want to say 57. And what he noticed, he was in Austria or Germany, somewhere over there. And what he noticed was three girls in his waiting room with similar hand movements. And he. He was um, kind of excited about that, and he went back and looked at his records and searched out other girls who had similar features. And from there, he eventually went, I think, across Europe looking for case studies of girls that had the same atypical hand movement and um, common history. Uh, he printed a paper, um, but it wasn't translated into English. And then um, later, 60s or 70s, um, someone else did a similar study that was um, translated into English. And um, because they um, were deferring to him discovering it first, they named it Rett syndrome. Second question. Well, around 12 months of age, I kind of noticed she wasn't learning anything new. Um, at 15 months of age, and she started losing things, I, I took her to the doctor. Um, they said nothing was wrong with her. Then um, I took her back every week, practically, until she was 18 months of age, when um, her normal pediatrician came back from TAD, which is temporary active duty, because we were in the military, and she said, there's something wrong with your child. And I said, yes, I know. <laughs> and she said, well, I think it's this thing called Rett syndrome, but I'm not sure. Um, and then began, she was 18 months of age. She didn't get diagnosed definitively until age six when the gene testing came out. And we took her to doctors, we even took her to a Rett specialist and he said, no, it's not Rett's. <laughs> Well, we know the answer to that question now. And third one. Um, I don't know if you know the figure for like how many army people, how many people are taking that drug. 
No, no one's taking it right now. I mean, like, what kind of taking it? There were uh, 53 participants who finished the trial. So that's how many people took it. Oh, the army's the army's drug is an IV medication. Is my understanding. It's given by IV in larger doses because they want to really repair the brain quickly. And this is only through my own reading, so um, I can't say for sure that that's a, right. But that is my understanding. And Caitlin's was an oral medication. And Rett syndrome affects every race, so there's no. It's not like African Americans get it more often or Caucasians get it more often. It affects everyone equally. So yeah, it, it doesn't discriminate. It screws everybody. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give somebody else a chance. Over there. I'll come back to you, though. Um, does uh, the NMZ have promise for uh, other disorders? Well, So the question is, does it have implications for other diseases besides Rett syndrome, that, right? So yes, Fragile X is the one that I talked about. It's an ongoing study right now. And also, um, I think I've read that, um, and I also came out on Autism Speaks, that they're looking at autism as, a, um, as something that they might be going towards with this medication. So that, that, that just came out on Autism Speaks. Yes? How much do you believe is really going on with competing lives and unable to communicate that? 100%. I, um, a couple years ago when they came out with the um, eye gaze devices, um, up until that point, I believed what the doctor said. She doesn't understand much. She, she's learning disabled and she doesn't understand. I'm like, I'm pretty sure she understands. No, no, she doesn't understand. Don't teach her. She's not going to learn anything. And then a few years ago, they came out with the eye gaze device and they learned that the girls did understand everything. There is one Rett syndrome girl who's since passed away who kept a blog. She learned how to use a keyboard and kept a blog. And um, it's a great insight into the life of a Rett syndrome child. And um, Again, the children who are getting their eye gazes, the eye gaze devices early are going into regular classrooms and learning. To which point, at which point, I started to homeschool Caitlin. In addition to sending her to high school, she has since learned. I've learned that the solar system is her favorite subject. She knows where the sun is, the Earth, the Moon, Saturn, and Jupiter. Um, Jupiter is her favorite. And she also likes to digest the system because it's so disgusting. <laughs> and um, she's learned most of her letters and um, she's learning to read. And was there anybody over here that I missed? Okay, or in the, in the blue. Between 15 months and 18 months. Right. Uh, no, um, just because she was diagnosed at the age of six doesn't mean that I didn't figure it out before then. Um, but we did take, she did go to a lot of specialists. Um, they did a lot of testing on her. One of the things they wanted to do on her was a muscle biopsy. And I was like, no, you're not going to do that. But uh, they, um, they kind of argued the two sets of doctors between themselves. Was it just global developmental delay? I had lunch, and, or Rett syndrome, and um, she had a lot of testing. And one of the most difficult days of my life, she was just turned two, and um, they were going to test her for a myriad of diseases. And they said, well, if any of these come back abnormal, she's going to die before she's five. I'm like, seriously? This is what you're going to tell me? And then, um, so they sent her for testing, and it took 11 blood, you know, sticks to draw her blood, and they couldn't do it. 
and finally they called the doctor in and he drew from her jugular vein. Now, that was the, one of the hardest moments of my life, watching someone stick a needle in my child's neck and draw blood out of it, and I was a mess. Yeah, that was awful. Um, two questions. Uh -huh. Do you have any um, dietary like, needs instead? A lot of girls do. A lot of girls um, are on like gluten-free diets and um, they have, or they're on feeding tubes, so they're definitely on on blended diets or some kind of um, like insurer or whatever. Caitlin can normally eat a normal diet, but um, case in point, in the last year she's lost 40 something pounds, and we don't know why. Um, she sometimes just won't eat, and we don't know why. She can't tell me why she doesn't want food anymore. So now she's on a um, special nutrition juice because she doesn't like Insure. So the stuff that has the calcium and is really good for her, she throws against the wall. <laughs> so she gets to drink juice boxes all day long and almost all of her calories at this point are coming from her um, nutrition drink. And then the other one, I know you said you were part of the military. Yes. Oh no, uh, being in the military has nothing to do with Rett syndrome. Rett syndrome is completely random. It's a genetic mutation that happens in across the globe. It has nothing to do with the environment or anything like that. The prevalence has it increased or decreased. It does depend on what country you're in. It's the same prevalence. Yes. The study was done in the U.S., yes. So all the school the store? I don't know the answer to that. I can't, I can't answer that. I don't know if anyone came from out of the country. What's that? The FDA did not run the study. The company that ran the study is Neuron Pharmaceuticals. They are based in Australia. They are funded by the U.S. Army um, to run the traumatic brain injury trial. And I don't know why they picked America to do the trial. Probably because um, it probably was easy. You know, they're looking for FDA approval. I, I don't know the answer to that question. So I, I, I can't say... All right, any other video we have? Yes? Um, two questions. Uh-huh. Uh, what's the average life expectancy for someone with Rett syndrome? And the second question? Because I don't like the first one. <laughs> I'll answer it, though. Go ahead. Um, and my second one was... Uh, uh, I forgot. <laughs> okay, so what's the life expectancy for a child with Rett syndrome? It used to be pretty low. Um, there's so many things that can go wrong. Seizures, GI issues, um, a, uh, the prolonged QT, and so it used to be almost like a death sentence, kind of. You, you, you would, if you read the material back when Caitlin was diagnosed, it's like, it's a progressive disease. I was literally told she was gonna die before she was 12, even when they kind of knew what she had. And, um, but since science has come a long way from, from when it was first um, discovered, there's a lot of palliative care now, um, a lot of new medications for seizure control. Um, there's medication now that works for the chronic constipation, which is really a major, one of our major issues. Um, sorry, Caitlin, but, um, so, and now with the advent of um, eye gaze device, the children are learning how to say where things are hurting. So that was a real big thing. If you can't say, tell somebody where it hurts, you're not gonna get fixed. Do you remember your second question yet? Yeah, I, I just remembered. Uh, have you ever considered getting her an eye gaze device? She does have one. Oh. She does, but it's, it's not a really great model and it's broken right now. So, <laughs> but um, from that I learned um, that her favorite color is orange, which I never had any idea. I thought it was, I thought it was red. 
Um, <laughs> and I also, uh, Mr. Watson uses it in school, and she was able to tell them that her lunch was yucky or disgusting.
I don't think it's ever more clear um, when math is actually used in the real world here. I mean, from the calculus to calculate how her metabolism is working as she's getting her doses, to the statistics and the experimental design that goes into figuring out whether or not the treatment is effective. There's math underneath all of this stuff, even though it's a very human story. Okay, so I think it's awesome. So thanks, guys. And thank you.